This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Book of Tea by Okakura Kakuzo Chapter 4. The Tea Room To European architects brought up on the traditions of stone and brick construction, our Japanese method of building with wood and bamboo seems scarcely worthy to be ranked as architecture. It is but quite recently that a competent student of Western architecture has recognized and paid tribute to the remarkable perfection of our great temples. Such being the case as regards our classic architecture, we could hardly expect the outsider to appreciate the subtle beauty of the tea room, its principles of construction and decoration being entirely different from those of the West. The tea room, the sukiya, does not pretend to be other than a mere cottage, a straw hut as we call it. The original ideographs for sukiya mean the abode of fancy. Latterly, the various tea masters substituted various Chinese characters according to their conception of the tea room, and the term sukiya may signify the abode of vacancy or the abode of the unsymmetrical. It is an abode of fancy inasmuch as it is an ephemeral structure built to house a poetic impulse. It is an abode of vacancy inasmuch as it is devoid of ornamentation except for what may be placed in it to satisfy some aesthetic need of the moment. It is an abode of the unsymmetrical inasmuch as it is consecrated to the worship of the imperfect, purposely leaving something unfinished for the play of the imagination to complete. The ideals of teaism have, since the 16th century, influenced our architecture to such a degree that the ordinary Japanese interior of the present day, on account of the extreme simplicity and chasteness of its scheme of decoration, appears to foreigners almost barren. The first independent tea room was the creation of Sen no Soyeki, commonly known by his later name of Rikyu, the greatest of all tea masters who in the 16th century under the patronage of Taiko Hideyoshi, instituted and brought to a high state of perfection the formalities of the tea ceremony. The proportions of the tea room had been previously determined by Jowo, a famous tea master of the 15th century. The early tea room consisted merely of a portion of the ordinary drawing room, partitioned off by screens for the purpose of the tea gathering. The portion partitioned off was called the kakoi, enclosure, a name still applied to those tea rooms which are built into a house and are not independent constructions. The sukiya consists of the tea room proper, designed to accommodate not more than five persons, a number suggestive of the saying, more than the graces and less than the muses. An anteroom, mitsuya, where the tea utensils are washed and arranged before brought in. A portico, machiai in which the guests wait until they receive the summons to enter the tea room, and a garden path, the roji, which connects the machiai with the tea room. The tea room is unimpressive in its appearance. It is smaller than the smallest of Japanese houses, while the materials used in its construction are intended to give the suggestion of refined poverty. Yet we must remember that all this is the result of profound artistic forethought, and the details have been worked out with care, perhaps even greater than that expended on the building of the richest palaces and temples. A good tea room is more costly than an ordinary mansion, for the selection of its materials, as well as its workmanship, requires immense care and precision. Indeed, the carpenters employed by the tea masters form a distinct and highly honored class among artisans, their work being no less delicate than that of the makers of lacquer cabinets. The tea room is not only different from any production of Western architecture, but also contrasts strongly with the classical architecture of Japan itself. Our ancient noble edifices, whether secular or ecclesiastical, were not to be despised even as regards their mere size. The few that have been spared in the disastrous conflagrations of centuries are still capable of awing us by their grandeur and richness of their decorations. Huge pillars of wood from two to three feet in diameter and from thirty to forty feet high, supported by a complicated network of brackets, 
the enormous beams which groaned under the weight of the tile-covered slanting roofs. The materials and mode of construction, though weak against fire, proved itself strong against earthquakes and was well suited to the climactic conditions of the country. In the golden hall of Horyuji and the pagoda of Yakushiji, we have noteworthy examples of the durability of our wooden architecture. These buildings have practically stood intact for nearly 12 centuries. The interior of the old temples and palaces was profusely decorated. In the Hōdō temple at Uji, dating from the 10th century, we can see the elaborate canopy and gilded baldachinos, many colored and inlaid with mirrors and mother of pearl, as well as remains of the paintings and sculpture which formerly covered the walls. Later at Nikko and in the Nijo Castle in Kyoto, we see structural beauty sacrificed to a wealth of ornamentation in which color and exquisite detail equals the utmost gorgeousness of Arabian or Moorish effort. The simplicity and purism of the tea room resulted from the emulation of the Zen monastery. A Zen monastery differs from those of other Buddhist sects inasmuch as it is meant to be only a dwelling place for the monks. Its chapel is not a place of worship or pilgrimage, but a college room where the students congregate for discussion and the practice of meditation. The room is bare except for a central alcove in which, behind the altar, is a statue of the Bodhidharma, the founder of the sect, or of Sakyamuni, attended by Kashyapa and Ananda, the two earliest Zen patriarchs. On the altar, flowers and incense are offered up in memory of the great contributions which these sages made to Zen. We have already said that it was the ritual instituted by the Zen monks of successively drinking tea out of a bowl before the image of Bodhidharma, which laid the foundations of the tea ceremony. We might add here that the altar of the Zen chapel was the prototype of the tokonoma, the place of honor in a Japanese room where paintings and flowers are placed for the edification of the guests. All our great tea masters were students of Zen and attempted to introduce the spirit of Zenism into the actualities of life. Thus the room, like the other equipments of the tea ceremony, reflect many of the Zen doctrines. The size of the orthodox tea room, which is four mats and a half, or ten feet square, is determined by the passage in the sutra of Vikramaditya. In that interesting work, Vikramaditya welcomes the saint Manjushiri and 84,000 disciples of Buddha into a room of this size, an allegory based on the theory of non-existence of space to the truly enlightened. Again, the roji, the garden path which leaves from the machiai to the tea room, signified the first stage of meditation, the passage into self-illumination. The roji was intended to break connection with the outside world and to produce a fresh sensation conducive to the full enjoyment of aestheticism in the tea room itself. One who has trodden this garden path cannot fail to remember how his spirit as he walked in the twilight of evergreens over the regular irregularities of the stepping stones, beneath which lay dried pine needles and passed beside the moss-covered granite lanterns, became uplifted above ordinary thoughts. One may be in the midst of a city, and yet feel as if he were in the forest far away from the dust and din of civilization. Great was the ingenuity displayed by the tea masters in producing these efforts of serenity and purity, the nature of the sensations to be aroused in passing through the roji differed with different tea masters. Some, like Rikyu, aimed at utter loneliness and claimed the secret of making a roji was contained in the ancient ditty, I looked beyond, flowers are not, nor tinted leaves on the sea beach. A solitary cottage stands in the waiting light of an autumn eve. Others, like Kobori Enshu, sought for a different effect. Enshu said that the idea of the garden path was to be found in the following verses. A cluster of summer trees, a bit of the sea, a pale evening moon. It is not difficult to gather his meaning. He wished to create the attitude of a newly awakened soul still lingering amid shadowy dreams of the past, yet bathing in the sweet unconsciousness of a mellow spiritual light, and yearning for the freedom that lay in the expanse beyond. Thus prepared, the guest will silently approach the sanctuary, and if a samurai will leave his sword on the rack beneath the eaves, 
the tea room being preeminently the house of peace. Then he will bend low and creep into the room through a small door not more than three feet in height. This proceeding was incumbent on all guests, high and low alike, and was intended to inculate humility. The order of precedence having been mutually agreed upon while resting in the machiai, the guests one by one will enter noiselessly and take their seats, first making obsolescence to the picture or flower arrangement on the tokonoma. The host will not enter the room until all the guests have seated themselves, and quiet reigns with nothing to break the silence, save the note of the boiling water in the iron kettle. The kettle sings well, for pieces of iron are so arranged in the bottom as to produce a peculiar melody in which one may hear the echoes of the cataract muffled by clouds, of the distant sea breaking among the rocks, a rainstorm sweeping through the bamboo forest, or the sowing of pines on some faraway hill. Even in the daytime the light in the room is subdued, for the low eaves of the slanting roof admit but few of the sun's rays. Everything is sober in tint from the ceiling to the floor. The guests themselves have carefully chosen garments of unobtrusive colors. The mellowness of age is over all. Everything suggestive of recent acquirement being tabooed save only the one note of contrast furnished by a bamboo dipper and the linen napkin, both immaculately white and new. However faded the tea room and the tea equipage may seem, everything is absolutely clean. Not a particle of dust will be found in the darkest corner, for if any exists, the host is not a tea master. One of the first requisites of a tea master is the knowledge of how to sweep, clean, and wash, for there is an art in cleaning and dusting. A piece of antique metal work must not be attacked with the unscrupulous zeal of the Dutch housewife. Dripping water from a flower vase need not be wiped away, for it may be suggestive of dew and coolness. In this connection, there is a story of Rikyu which well illustrates the ideas of cleanliness entertained by the tea masters. Rikyu was watching his son, Shoan, as he swept through and watered the garden path. Not clean enough, said Rikyu when Shoan had finished his task and bade him try again. After a weary hour, the son returned to Rikyu. Father, there is nothing more to be done. The steps have been washed for the third time. The stone lanterns and the trees are well sprinkled with water. Moss and lichens are shining with a fresh verdure. Not a twig, not a leaf have I left on the ground. Young fool, chided the tea master. That is not the way a garden path should be swept. Saying this, Rikyu stepped into the garden, shook a tree and scattered over the garden gold and crimson leaves, scraps of the brocade of autumn. What Rikyu demanded was not cleanliness alone, but the most beautiful and the natural also. The name Abode of Fancy implies a structure created to meet some individual artistic requirement. The tea room is made for the tea master, not the tea master for the tea room. It is not intended for posterity and is therefore ephemeral. The idea that everyone should have a house of his own is based on an ancient custom of the Japanese race. Shinto superstition ordaining that every dwelling should be evacuated on the death of its chief occupant. Perhaps there may have been some unrealized sanitary reason for this practice. Another early custom was that a newly built house should be provided for each couple that married. It is on account of such customs that we find the imperial capital so frequently moved from one site to another in ancient days. The rebuilding every twenty years of the Issei Temple the supreme shine of the sun goddess, is an example of one of these ancient rites, which still obtain at the present day. The observance of these customs was only possible with some such form of construction as that furnished by our system of wooden architecture, easily pulled down, easily built up. A more lasting style, employing brick and stone, would have rendered migrations impracticable, as indeed they became when the more stable and massive wooden construction of China was adopted by us after the Nara period. With the predominance of Zen individualism in the 15th century, however, the old idea became imbued with a deeper significance as conceived in connection with the tea room. Zenism, with the Buddhist theory of evanescence in its demands for the mastery of spirit over matter, recognized the house as only a temporary refuge for the body. 
The body itself was but as a hut in the wilderness, a flimsy shelter made by tying together the grasses that grew around. When these ceased to be bound together, they again became resolved into the original waste. In the tea room, fugitiveness is suggested in the thatched roof, frailty in the slender pillars, lightness in the bamboo support, apparent carelessness in the use of commonplace materials. The eternal is to be found only in the spirit which is embodied in these simple surroundings, beautifies them with the subtle light of its refinement. That the tea room should be built to suit some individual taste is an enforcement of the principle of vitality in art. Art, to be fully appreciated, must be true to contemporaneous life. It is not that we should ignore the claims of posterity, but that we should seek to enjoy the present more. It is not that we should disregard the creations of the past, but that we should try to assimilate them into our consciousness. Slavish conformity to traditions and formulas fetters the expression of individuality in architecture. We can but weep over the senseless imitations of European buildings which one beholds in modern Japan. We wonder why, among the most progressive Western nations, architecture should be so devoid of originality, so replete with repetitions of obsolete styles. Perhaps we are now passing through an age of democratization in art, while awaiting the rise of some princely master who shall establish a new dynasty. Would that we loved the ancients more and copied them less. It has been said that the Greeks were great because they never drew from the antique. The term abode of vacancy, besides conveying the Taoist theory of the all-containing, involves the conception of a continued need of change in decorative motives. The tea room is absolutely empty except for what may be placed there temporarily to satisfy some aesthetic mood. Some special art object is brought in for the occasion, and everything else is selected and arranged to enhance the beauty of the principal theme. One cannot listen to different pieces of music at the same time, a real comprehension of the beautiful being possible only through concentration upon some central motive. Thus it will be seen that the system of decoration in our tea rooms is opposed to that which obtains in the West, where the interior of a house is often converted into a museum. To a Japanese accustomed to simplicity of ornamentation and frequent change of decorative method, a Western interior permanently filled with a vast array of pictures, statuary, and bric-a-brac gives the impression of mere vulgar display of riches. It calls for a mighty wealth of appreciation to enjoy the constant sight of even a masterpiece, and limited indeed must be the capacity for artistic feeling in those who can exist day after day in the midst of such confusion of color and form as is to be often seen in the houses of Europe and America. The abode of the unsymmetrical suggests another phase of our decorative scheme. The absence of symmetry in Japanese art objects has often been commented on by Western critics. This also is a result of a working out through Zenism of Taoist ideas. Confucianism, with its deep-seated idea of dualism, and Northern Buddhism, with its worship of a trinity, were in no way opposed to the expression of symmetry. As a matter of fact, if we study the ancient bronzes of China or the religious arts of the Tang dynasty and the Nara period, we shall recognize a constant striving after symmetry. The decoration of our classical interiors was decidedly regular in its arrangement. The Taoist and Zen conception of perfection, however, was different. The dynamic nature of their philosophy laid more stress upon the process through which perfection was sought than upon perfection itself. True beauty could be discovered only by one who mentally completed the incomplete. The virility of life and art lay in its possibilities for growth. In the tea room it is left for each guest in imagination to complete the total effort in realization to himself. Since Zenism has become the prevailing mode of thought, the art of the extreme orient has purposely avoided the symmetrical as expressing not only completion but repetition. Uniformity of design was considered as fatal to the freshness of imagination. Thus, landscapes, birds, and flowers became the favorite subjects for the depiction rather than the human figure, the latter being present in the person of the beholder himself. We are often too much in evidence as it is, and in spite of our vanity, even self-regard is apt to become monotonous. 
In the tea room, the fear of repetition is a constant presence. The various objects for the decoration of a room should be selected that no color or design shall be repeated. If you have a living flower, a painting of flowers is not allowable. If you are using a round kettle, the water pitcher should be angular. A cup with a black glaze should not be associated with a tea caddy of black lacquer. In placing a vase or incense burner on the tokonoma, care should be taken not to put it in the exact center, lest it divide the space into equal halves. The pillar of the tokonoma should be of a different kind of wood from the other pillars in order to break any suggestion of monotony in the room. Here again the Japanese method of interior decoration differs from that of the Occident, where we see objects arranged symmetrically on mantelpieces and elsewhere. In Western houses we are often confronted with what appears to be useless reiteration. We find it trying to talk to a man while his full-length portrait stares at us from behind his back. We wonder which is real, he of the picture or he who talks, and feels a curious conviction that one of them must be a fraud. Many a time have we sat on a festive board contemplating, with a secret shock to our digestion, the representation of abundance on the dining room walls. Why these pictured victims of chase and sport, the elaborate carvings of fishes and fruit? Why the display of family plates, reminding us of those who have dined and are dead? The simplicity of the tea room and its freedom from vulgarity make it truly a sanctuary from the vexations of the outer world. There and there alone can one consecrate himself to the undisturbed adoration of the beautiful. In the 16th century, the tea room afforded a welcome respite from labor to the fierce warriors and statesmen engaged in the unification and reconstruction of Japan. In the 17th century, after the strict formalization of the Tokugawa rule had been developed, it offered the only opportunity possible for the free communication of artistic spirits. Before a great work of art, there was no distinction between daimyo, samurai, and commoner. Nowadays, industrialism is making our true refinement more and more difficult all the world over. Do we not need a tea room more than ever? This is the end of part four of the Book of Tea by Okakura Kakuzo. Recorded October 10th, 2006 in Olga, Washington.